Welcome to the UVM Extension Building Capacity Webinar Series. And this webinar series is just one part of a larger learning project to help you build capacity for leadership within your organization, as well as more effectively achieve the mission of your organization. The education and training provided in the Building Capacity Project is delivered in a variety of forms covering 10 topics, uh, board development, conflict management, developing volunteers, ethical leadership, leading through change, quality service, staff development and evaluation, strategic planning, team leadership, and working in teams. Today the topic of our discussion is ethical leadership. Um, we do have coaching available for people who would like a little extra attention and um, you can begin that process by just letting us know that you're interested. Uh, an email to um, capacity at uvm.edu um, will set you right up. Okay, um, and without further ado we're going to turn this over to our presenter Jane Van Buren and her topic, what is ethical leadership? Okay, hi Stephanie and Lucy and Ellen. Um, Stephanie, this is going to be a one-on-one -on -one session, so we should uh, feel free to bring it down a notch in terms of formality, and you should interrupt me at any time and ask questions. Um, so I start with this slide not to uh, to show off my relationship with Dr. Phil because there is none, but but to uh, introduce myself and talk about the many different hats that I wear and, and how I think that leads me to the point where I can talk about nonprofits with um, some degree of knowledge. Um, the Dr. Phil reference was that I testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee last summer and um, I thought it was interesting because people think of Dr. Phil as a leader and he also testified with me and there we were testifying in front of uh, really traditional leaders, people that we've elected into leadership positions. So it sort of tied both, um, you know, tied those two together. So I stuck it in there. Um, but anyway, just to, to tell you a little bit more about myself, I teach in the Master of Public Administration program at UVM. I teach two classes now. One is, uh, three classes actually. One is um, nonprofit administration that I'm currently teaching. In the fall, I teach a class on board development and fundraising, which is a lot of fun. And I've been teaching some online one credit courses on nonprofit careers for undergraduates, which um, I did over the uh, winter term and I'll do again this summer. Then in addition, I am an executive director. I work for a nonprofit organization in Burlington that is a domestic violence service organization. We're a 40 year old organization. I've been there for about three years. And I consult, sort of fitting around the edges with um, different organizations that need help with strategic planning, board governance, organizational development. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Okay, so Stephanie, this is where I'd like you to tell me uh, what you do. Um, so tell me what, what job you have, why you're interested in this topic, um, you know, are you a lead do you consider yourself in a leadership position? So just if you could type, that'd be great. So oh, great. So you, you are you supervising and you are running the program, so you're familiar with a lot of different aspects of, of program management. Um, that does definitely sound like a leadership position. So good. So hopefully we'll have lots of interesting conversations throughout this presentation. So this is what I want to talk about for the next hour. Um, so the, what do we mean by ethical leadership? Why do we even care about it? Uh, should we be caring about it more in the nonprofit sector? And then I have some very specific ways that people can create an ethical culture in their organization. So that's, that's what we're going to be covering. And again, Stephanie, please interrupt me with any time, at any time with questions. You can just type them right in. Um, what is ethical leadership? And I just, these are just definitions of, of ethics, leadership, and a leader. So, and as we will discuss throughout this presentation, being a leader doesn't necessarily mean that you're ethical, which we all know. Um, so it's how can you, how can you as a leader become more ethical and promote an ethical culture in your organization? Um, and we also know that, that um, all organizations can face ethical challenges. It doesn't matter whether you're a nonprofit or a for-profit or a government. There are ethical challenges around every corner. And some, which we'll also discuss a little bit later, can result in criminal violations. Um, most commonly in the nonprofit sector, it's mismanagement of, of money, fraud, <clears throat> uh, conflict of interest, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, conflict of interest, is, which we'll talk about, is on the fringes. And many of the ethical problems are on the fringes, kind of in this gray area. 
Um, you know, lack of accountability, lack of transparency. Is it really a conflict of interest? How can we tell? You know, is someone considered unethical if they didn't know? Um, you know, if they misallocated resources just because they were not aware of how they should be allocated correctly. So we'll, we'll delve into those questions a little bit as we go through. But Stephanie, what does it mean to you? What does ethical leadership mean to you? You're kind of on the spot, aren't you, Stephanie? <laughs> Sorry. Right, very good. Yeah, I think that's this. Um, leader does the right thing, still learning. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's knowing right from wrong. It's, it's, you know, building that culture where people around you also understand right from wrong. Absolutely. Those are all correct. So here's some examples that I thought about um, when I was putting this together. And actually this, this happened or something similar to this happened in an organization that I worked with. Um, so say, for example, J. Jill donates lots of, of clothes to your organization. Um, and you serve people who are currently homeless. So, you know, the ethical, this is a very basic example, but the ethical leader makes sure that the clothes go to the clients, right? Um, a non-ethical leader picks what she wants for her own personal use and then makes the clothes available to clients. And that, I, I, you know, I give that as an example because it's very basic and it's very right and wrong, pretty black and white. Um, but it's something that happens in nonprofit organizations all the time. Things are donated. And uh, but particularly in social service organizations, they're donated. And, and really, the ethical leader has to demonstrate to her staff um, and to herself that these are donated for the recipient, not for staff. And that's, that's something that comes up a lot in nonprofit organizations. And here's another example. Um, you know, we talk a lot about workplace values and organizational values. And we always, you know, people have mission statements and value statements, and they always talk about transparency and communication. Um, and so an ethical leader really has to, to model those values, treating staff fairly, providing um, staff with the information they need to make decisions. Um, and a non-ethical leader was someone who doesn't do that as well, who, who makes decisions based on favoritism. And even the strongest cultures, even the strongest workplace cultures can't counter the impact of employees who witness non-ethical behavior. Um, you know, playing favoritism, withholding information, stifling dissent, applying different standards to themselves than they do to their employees. It, even if you have a great staff, they're not going to be able to stand up to that. It's going to, be, to completely erode morale. Um, you know, so some organizations do different things to put into place uh, policies to prevent that. Um, one is, you know, policy, for example, that the, that the head of the organization, the highest paid person in the organization, can't make more than X percent than the lower paid person. Ben and Jerry's used to do that, for instance. Um, but at any rate, no matter what your organization does, the, it is the job of the leader of the organization to make sure that, that um, things are fair, that the leader is not being compensated exorbitantly, that there's a good distribution. Um, and that people feel like they're being treated fairly and have the information they need to do their job well. Um, so I put up this because I, I, again, because when we think of leaders, we frequently think of people who are famous. And so I put this up to demonstrate that that's true. But also it's, it's in different ways. It's people from business. It's people from government. Um, it's people from, from uh, the social the, uh, policy sector like Martin Luther King, Gandhi. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, Mary Kay, and Steve Jobs, both very influential business people. So th these are all very influential leaders, leaders, many of whom struggled with ethical challenges, as we know. Um, but we still think of them as influential leaders. So I think that there's a, um, it's not a gray area, but there's a, there are different leadership styles that lead people to more ethical behavior or less ethical behavior. And as, you know, having an affair while you're in office and ethical lapse of leadership, I, you know, I don't know, that's different interpretations of that question. But um, I put this slide up here so we could look at different leaders. And then here's another one, um, Mr. Clinton. And he is somebody that, you know, we all had questions about his ethics, and yet um, we consider him a very influential leader, and we consider him setting a, a leader, you know, the, setting the moral tone, you know, what was going on in the country. Um, and do presidents have that responsibility to set the moral tone for the country? Clearly, executive directors do have the responsibility to set the moral tone for the organization. Um, and people vary in their capacity for moral judgment, you know, in their ability to recognize and analyze different moral issues. 
and the priority that they place on those issues. Um, and people also differ in their capacity for moral behavior and in their ability to cope with the frustrations of the job and um, to make good on commitments, so in their follow through. Um, you know, organizations, as I said before, really signal their priorities for ethical behavior in, in lots of different ways, um, including having ethical standards, having ethical policies, how you hire, how you promote, how you compensate, um, and the fairness and respect that you treat with which you treat your employees. Those are all ethical practices. People carry, you know, as I said before, people care a lot about organizational justice. And I think staff perform better when they believe that their workplace is treating them with dignity and is rewarding their ethical conduct. Um, you know, work, workers, staff, as I'm sure we all know and have experienced, staff respond to um, moral clues from their peers and from their leaders. Okay? So, this brings us to why we should be concerned about ethical leadership in the nonprofit sector. And I put these logos up not to imply anything one way or the other about whether or not they're ethical. Um, but just to give you an idea of the different kinds of nonprofits, and I included two slides of organizations that have been in the news recently because of, of um, behavior that was not considered ethical. Um, one is the United Way, and this was several years ago. This was in 1992, but William Armory, who was the CEO of that organization, um, was convicted and sent to prison for fraud and financial mismanagement. And it was a big case. And then more recently than that, um, the Smithsonian in 2007, the uh, CEO resigned. And, it, you know, it came out that he was absent from his job uh, for 400 days over a period of seven years. And he was earned, he earned $5.7 million on outside work um, while he was executive director and that he abused his expense account. I mean, there were all these stories that came out in the news about having Smithsonian staff cleaning his house and flying his spouse here and there. And so, um, the, well, and then to finish up with that, a congressional report concluded that he created an imperialistic and insular culture that discouraged dissent, kept secrets, and limited the flow of information to the board of directors whose job it was to hire and oversee him. So his, his unethical behavior trickled down to his staff. And, um, you know, the second ranking official was also fired for similar uh, egregious behavior and the head of the Latino Center of the Smithsonian was also fired. So his, his, his behavior at the top really had an impact on people below him. Um, and what he did was really egregious, so it's a pretty big example um, of ethical behavior. But um, my, my question about all of this to, to you is, would we have been as concerned if they had occurred in the for-profit sector? You know, do we apply the same standard to the nonprofit sector that we apply to the for-profit sector when it comes to um, ethical violations? What do people think? More no concern over the nonprofit sector. Um, I would agree, and, and we shall explore why in just a second. Yes, I agree. But so why do we? We'll explore this in a sec. Um, we have to remember some very basic things about the nonprofit sector that are not true about the for-profit sector. Um, one is that nonprofits operate with public support, and we need to maintain that trust, the trust from the public. Um, we are supported by taxpayers because we don't pay income tax on our revenues. Um, and we receive financial support from government and from private foundations and individuals. So we have to have, the, I believe, that nonprofits have to maintain a high standard of transparency and integrity if they want to continue to get that support. Um, you know, with a for-profit business, if people feel like they're act, acting unethically, um, they can, you know, walk, they can talk with their feet. Is that what they say? They can, you know, they don't have to support that business anymore. Um, nonprofits can't afford to take that risk. Nonprofits really need to maintain uh, the support of the community. So let me give you a little statistics. Um, in 2008, there was a Brookings Institute survey that found that about one-third of Americans reported having not too much or no confidence in charitable organizations. And 70%, 70% felt that charitable organizations waste a great deal or a fair amount of money. Only 10% thought charitable organizations did a very good job spending money wisely. And only 17% thought that charities did a very good job of being fair in decisions 
and only one quarter thought charities did a very good job of helping people. I mean, those, we have to agree, are very dismal statistics. Um, a Harris poll found in 2006 that only one in 10 Americans believe that charities are honest and ethical in their use of donated funds. So, you know, I, th I think it is incumbent upon us as leaders in the nonprofit sector to try to turn those statistics around. And the rest of this webinar will talk about um, how, how, you know, how organizations can begin, to, can begin to position themselves so that they can demonstrate to the public and to their revenue sources that they are ethical and have in place high standards. So uh, we have any questions at this point? Are there any other reasons that we think we ought to be concerned about this? I'm mulling everything over. I know I feel like I'm, it's just a pretty lecture heavy webinar. Um, so if you have questions, I'm, I'm hoping that you will ask. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is, these are the areas where ethical issues can arise in the nonprofit sector. And this is the, we're going to be going through these one by one. Um, so these are the, the, what is it, six areas, compensation, conflict of interest, publications and donor solicitation, financial integrity, investment policy, accountability, and strategic management. And these come from the Stanford Social Innovation Review, which if you don't know it and haven't seen it, it's worth, it's worth looking. They have some really excellent articles in that, in that publication. And you can go online um, and Google it, and you, some of them can come up. You can also subscribe. But I'm going to talk at you for a few minutes before I um, change the slide. Um, so compensation. Salaries are modest by business, that are modest by business standards can cause outrage in the nonprofit sector. So there's a whole different standard. You know, you can be the president of a bank in Vermont and make over a million dollars. You could never be director of a nonprofit in Vermont and make that kind of money. Um, I mean, there's some obvious reasons for that. Nonprofits don't have that kind of money, but it's also we fall under um, IRS legislation about what's reasonable compensation, and nonprofits need to follow that and not be, not pay themselves exorbitantly. The next one is conflict of interest. Um, conflict of interest at, is a, so just to, to give you a definition. Um, it's when there's a potential conflict between the organizations. Um, yes, I agree, Stephanie, that no, yeah, makes you wonder about those organizations a bit. It does. It does make, makes you, particularly if you see that the senior leadership is paid a lot of money and the people who are program managers or program direct, program workers are paid less. Um, that makes you uh, question what's going on in that organization and where they have their values. Although I will be the first one to argue that, this, that executive directors ought to be paid a decent salary. It doesn't mean that you have to take a vow of poverty to work for a nonprofit organization. It's just finding that balance between what is reasonable and, what, and between that and what's exorbitant. Um, okay, so back to conflict of interest. Uh, so the, the reason that nonprofits have to think about conflict of interest is, is primarily because their boards of directors are made up of community members. So you might have a CPA and a lawyer and a contractor and um, I don't know, a medical person on your board, and, um, and they're, they're the board on an org of an organization that probably doesn't have a lot of money. And so there are some times when conflict of interest can arise because the um, people on the board are given contracts to do work because they're available in there, and then that presents a conflict. Um, so, um, you know, is it the board's member's disclosure to, to vote enough? You know, can can a major donor receive special privileges? All of that sort of thing that a nonprofit has to keep themselves aware of. Say, for example, you have a major donor on your board. She says to you, I'll give you $100,000 if you let me, um, you know, direct the program or only if you do this and that. And so the, an organization really has to have some pretty firm policies in place to avoid conflict of interest. And board members and staff members should disclose annually um, what other organizations they're affiliated with so that, so that they can be aware of any potential conflict of interest that's coming down the, the street. Um, publications and donor solicitation. This is an interesting area that I think a lot of organizations don't think about very much. But um, 
you have to make sure that in order to maintain public trust and, and to fulfill your fiduciary obligations, which is the obligation the nonprofit board has to make sure that the organization is run in a fiscally sound legal way, um, they, that the organization should make sure that in all of their publications and donor solicitations, they're transparent. Um, they should you know, talk about how they're going to deal with potential conflicts and how, how they operate so that they are operating in an ethical and financially sound way. Um, and then when you get to the solicitation and publication piece, um, you have to make sure when you are talking about the organization that you're not um, lying, which you, obviously you're not going to do on purpose. But if organizations say, for example, that 100% of the money you give me is going to go to, 100% of it's going to go to this program, you're setting yourself up for a problem because it's not, it's not true. 100% does not go directly to the program. Um, it's, it's not um, possible. And the Red Cross learned that way the hard way when um, uh, we can all remember after 9-11 when they got a lot of money and you know, money was just flowing into the Red Cross after 9-11. And um, people believe that that money was going to go straight to people who were affected directly by the um, attacks. And, but the Red Cross set aside more than half of the money that they received, so about $250 million, um, to put in their future reserves for future disasters. And, you know, that was something that the Red Cross always did. They held back some of the money for future, for future um, but they hadn't let anybody know that. And so there was this huge outcry, and donors were outraged. Um, and the Red Cross had to, you know, apologize and redirect the funds, and um, it, it tarnished their image. So you have to make sure in all of your publications and donor solicitations that you're transparent, that you tell them what you're going to be doing with the money, um, that you help your donors understand that in order to run effective programs, you have to have, um, you have to be paying some administrative costs, and that's where some of their money is going to go. That's a really important lesson for the public to start to wrap their heads around. Um, so transparency is necessary in solicitation materials, grant proposals, and donor agreements. Organizations cannot afford to raise funds on the basis of misguided assumptions. You know, just just is going to rear its head. Um, so then we get to financial integrity, and um, what this is talking about. How can a nonprofit? Sorry, I'm going to interrupt myself to look at Stephanie's question. How can a nonprofit be transparent other than the annual report? Um, you know, in everything that you do, every, every publication that goes out, you can talk about what your practices are. Um, the annual report is an excellent place to do it. All your grant, you know, your grant proposals should talk about how you're transparent. Um, your, uh, if you send out an annual appeal letter, that can talk about what this money is going to be spent for. Um, so that every time that you're sending out any kind of a donor appeal or grant request, you should be putting in there how you're spending the money so that you can be transparent. Um, and I think it's also something that you should talk to your staff about so that they know um, when they're talking to people what the, how, what, what the money coming, is, coming in is being spent for and how much it really costs to run the organization. Those are important things for staff to know as well, I think, um, and to be really, to give them the information they need to make good decisions. Does that help Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So financial integrity. This one is um, an interesting one, I think, and one that I have thought about for a long time and talked to my classes about for a long time, and I don't think there's any, I mean, obviously you need to be, have integrity in your financial, but what this is really talking about is who are you taking money from? You know, if, if you're the Cancer Society, do you take money from um, tobacco companies? If you're... Um, you know, working with people with AIDS, you take money from the pharmaceutical industry. You know, if you're a women's study program, you take money from Playboy. And so how you really have to be able to back up your decisions about what kind of money you're going to be accepting and what kind of money is funding your programs um, and have that, that uh, integrity to be able to hold your head high and say, you know, this is, is, is I had an executive director one time who used to say, um, you know, how are you going to feel if you, if you read about this in the Burlington Free Press? You know, what if it comes out, are you going to be able to hold your head high and defend your position? And I think that this, that's what this is talking about, you know, making sure that the money coming in um, is money that you can be proud of and is money that is going to be supporting your programs in a way that you can justify. 
Um, investment policies, same kind of thing. Um, you know, figure out where your money is. How you know what? How if you should be so lucky to have money in an investment account? Um, what's it being invested in? Can you justify it? Um, in uh, 2007, the Los Angeles Times ran an article about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and accused them of investing in companies that contributed to the environmental and health problems that the foundation was attempting to reduce. And so, you know, you can't be a um, Again, you know, cancer society, if you have an investment account, you're not going to be investing in tobacco companies. You, you know, you're not going to have a, a um, stock in Marlboro or I don't even know if Marlboro is public, but you get my point. Um, so all of it is, is really, does it, pass the, does it pass the smell test? Can you really justify and be proud of your practices? And then the last one is accountability and strategic management. Um, you know, this, this comes down to having a good plan and um, using your resources in a very principled way, developing a well-informed strategic plan, and money held in public trust should be well spent, not just well intentioned. And uh, that you know, kind of wraps it all up, getting back to how you can, be, how you can have integrity, how you can avoid conflicts of interest, um, how you can be transparent. You, know, you, can't, you can't just say this is how we intend to spend the money. You have to demonstrate that that is how you are spending the money and that is how you are soliciting the money. Okay, so moving on, what do you do? How can you create a culture um, that, you know, that will create this atmosphere in your organization? Um, there's really no set of rules about this. That, you know, there's, no organization, there's no way that you can put together an organizational structure that's going to guarantee ethical conduct, but you can certainly take a lot of steps to make sure that it's more possible, that an ethical culture will emerge. Um, and strong organizational cultures, you know, there's all, all sorts of evidence that says that strong cultures have a big influence on employee behavior you know, in, in the community. So you want to make sure that your strong organizational culture is supportive of a high ethical standard, which means it's supportive of its workers, it's supportive of its practices, and has things in place. So number one, be a visible role model. And we've talked about this a little bit. You know, the employees look to the behavior of the top management as a benchmark for defining their own appropriate behavior. You know, if you're taking clothes from J. Jill, they're going to take clothes from J. Jill. Um, but if you are taking the ethical high road, uh, it provides a positive message for all your employees. And the reason I included this coffee cup is that I, I uh, also for this ethical leadership project, I interviewed leaders in the community, I mean, executive directors in the community whom I considered to be ethical leaders. And um, one of them talked about this, you know, washing a coffee cup is one way that she sort of gave that role modeling to her employees about ethical behavior, um, which I thought was interesting because it's not something that I would think of as, as a, you know, a, a litmus test for ethical behavior, but she seemed to think it was. And she said, you know, I can put the coffee cup in the sink and walk away, or I can stand there and wash it. Which one's going to give the right message to my staff? And that's something leaders have to think about all the time. What is the message that I'm giving to my staff? The next one, um, communicate ethical expectations. You know, create a, an organizational code of ethics and uh, state the organization's values and ethical rules. I don't think very many organizations have a code of ethics. I, I um, think that a lot of us think that we do because we have value statements or we have vision statements. Um, you know, we sort of put together personnel policies that say what you can and cannot do. But we don't, I don't think organizations very often sit down and think about, okay, what, what, what are, what's our ethical code? You know, how do we define ourselves through an ethical framework? Um, so an ethical code should state the organization's primary values and the ethical rules that employees are expected to follow. This is what's acceptable. If widely accepted and enforced, codes can also reinforce the values, the core values of the organization. They can deter misconduct, they can promote trust, and can reduce the organization's risks of conflict interests and legal liability. Um, but however, you know, the caveat on all of these things is just because you have one doesn't mean that it's going to increase ethical conduct. It really depends completely on how you develop those ethical expectations, how they're perceived, and how they're integrated into the workplace function. 
I mean, I think we can all imagine the scenario where the executive director or the board says, okay, here's our ethical code, follow it. And the staff and the rest of the, you know, organization is saying, well, you know, we didn't have any part in coming up with these, these ethical expectations, so we're, you know, we're going to reject it. And so with everything else, you need to include different voices, people from different levels in the organization, um, and you have to be very clear about how you intend to integrate it into the organization's practice and, and get the buy-in of staff to do that. Any questions? Oh, absolutely. Are there tools available to help us do that? Um, uh, yes, yes, there are. Um, you know, this is one of them that, you know, we're going to 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 talk about, um, you know, we'll keep on going through these steps and we'll get here's some tools. But there, if you go to that Stanford, the Stanford Review, for instance, um, and I can make some of these things available to Alan and Lucy to put on the website. There's some interesting articles about this and how to have this conversation in the organization. Um, so you'll be able to find lots of, of help in this. Um, and, and really, you know, don't overthink it. That's my, that's been my mantra this year on a lot of things is don't overthink it. You know, ethical expectations are really what you learn in grade school. You know, do unto others as you would have others do to you. So, you know, what do we, what, what, what code of behavior do we want to have in this organization so that we can all feel valued and trusting and um, get the job done that we are here to do? So it's, it's just, it's a conversation, and um, there are some tools that help, can help you think about how to start that conversation, but again, it's, it's um, a lot of it's common sense, common from, you know, we all grew up with, with our values, and it's taking those and translating them into a way that works for the organization. Uh, promoting effective financial management, and, you know, and this is clearly the where, where a lot of nonprofits get in trouble, um, inadvertently, sometimes not, but um, you know, it's, it's um, but let me tell you about this one. Okay, so nonprofits can foster ethical behavior and promote public trust is to use their resources in a socially responsible way. And we talked a little bit about that earlier. You know, can you hold your head up and can you justify? Um, you know, donors are now frequently going to these watchdog groups like Charity Navigator or um, uh, I can't remember what the other one is. Um, that they rate nonprofits on the percentage of the funds that go to administration rather than programs. And I think that this, this sort of rating system responds to people's real concerns about, the, you know, about how nonprofits are being run. But I think it reinforces the wrong performance measures. Um, it, it, it distorts the organizational priorities and it leads nonprofits to disingenuous accounting practices. If you know as a nonprofit that people want 100% of the money to go to programs and nothing to go to administration, you're going to start working the book so that it looks that way, right? Um, and, and again, you know, it's probably not um, egregious or there's not malfeasance, but it's just this, it's disingenuous. It's not true. And it's promoting these wrong measurements. Um, the crucial question, I think, that donors and funders should consider is what's the cost effectiveness of the organization? You know, what, what, what are they doing? How well are they doing it? Is anybody better off because they are doing it? And what is it costing them to do it? Um, so I think, I think nonprofits need to face that head on and start to educate the public more about how much it's costing to run the programs. Um, and that will lead to sort of this high, high integrity and ethical behavior. So, um, you know, in order to do that, you need better institutional oversight, you need greater public education, you need to be transparent, you need to talk about your performance measures, you need to look at outcomes, um, you need to have common standards for accounting, and um, developing better rating systems, you know, for the effectiveness of the organization should be the priority. You know, it doesn't really, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how much is spent on admin and how much is spent on programs. What really matters is how effective is that program and is it making a difference? And you know, how, what's, what, are, what are the outcome measurements that we can look at that demonstrate that it is making a difference? And that's the, that's the conversation that we ought to be having with donors and the public. Um, uh, and so again, just to reinforce this, I think that organizations that can claim that 100% of the donors' money is going to go to programs are, are setting themselves up for that ethical dilemma. I think we need to be really honest about that. Okay, 
Um, ethical training. This is a, a good way to to, to um, start the conversation as well as, as send people to trainings or bring someone in to talk to your staff. Um, you know, like this webinar, for instance, uh, and, and maybe there are others, other trainings that you can find. Uh, unfortunately, in Vermont, there's not an awful lot um, outside of, of UVM and um, Common Good Vermont is another place to look that has um, trainings and seminars. There's going to be a conference next week, as a matter of fact, that Common Good's putting on for Vermont nonprofits. Um, so it's, you know, it's a, that those sorts of uh, venues are a good opportunity for you to be networking with other nonprofit leaders and asking, you know, what do you do? What, what's considered best practice here? What, have you come across this situation? What are you doing about it? Do you have a code of ethics? Can I look at it? Um, so in the absence of sort of formal trainings in Vermont, we have opportunities for networking, which I think is, is really, really valuable. Um, institutionalize an ethical culture. Focus on means and on ends. So um, the, there's an ethics resource center, and it, it talks about organizations having a strong ethical culture when it's top management leads with integrity, supervisors reinforce ethical conduct, coworkers display a commitment to ethics, and the organization integrates its values in day-to-day -day decision making. So I think, Stephanie, probably if you look at what you do day-to-day, -day, you're doing that. You're integrating your ethical culture. It's just a question of talking to your staff about that and making it more visible. In organizations with strong ethical cultures, employees report far less misconduct, feel less pressure to compromise their own ethical values, and are less likely to experience retaliation for whistleblowing, which we'll talk about later on. Um, so this survey that the National Nonprofit, that, or the Ethics Research Center did, um, is consistent with other research. And it underscores the importance of factoring ethical concerns into all organizational activities. So we've talked about all of that. We've talked about resource allocation, strategic planning, compensation decisions, personnel, how you hire, what, you know, what are the policies in place for hiring, um, performance evaluations, auditing, communications, public relations. So a strong ethical culture will really permeate, permeate all of those different areas. Um, so as a leader of a nonprofit, you're going to face issues where you, it's not clear what the moral course of action is. Um, and so it's, it's, you should strive for a decision-making process that is transparent and responsive to everybody's interests. So if you don't know what to do, you need to be upfront about it. Um, and you need to be transparent when you do reach a decision about how you reach that decision. And nonprofit executives and their board members should also be willing to ask uncomfortable questions. So you shouldn't be asking, is this legal? You know, can we do this? Is this legal? But you should be asking, is it fair? Is it honest? Does it advance societal interests or does it pose risks? And again, how would it, how would it feel to defend the decision on the evening news? Back to my old executive director. Um, but you know, not only do we need to ask those questions of ourselves, but we need to invite the, we need to invite responses from others, even if we don't want to hear it or if we aren't going to agree with it. Um, so as a, as a person in a position of power, as a leader, um, you really should actively solicit diverse opinions and perspectives. And that's why I think it's so important to have a diverse board. You don't want a board that will sit around and nod their heads every time you come up with a justification for a decision. You want people to challenge you. You want diverse opinions on the board so you can really think through these ethical issues um, and have reference points to check your own moral compass against. So, and I'm making it sound like every day is going to be an ethical dilemma, and that's certainly not the case. Um, but you, you know, the more that you have things in place and the more you have diverse voices around the table, the better, you'll, you, know, the better you will be going down the road when things do pop up. So the last one is... The last uh, step is to provide protective mechanisms and whistleblower protection. This is something that came out um, with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act that, that really nonprofits had to have whistleblower protection so that you can, uh, nonprofit employees can feel they can discuss ethical dilemmas and report unethical behavior without the fear of being reprimanded. And uh, that's definitely something that you should have in your personnel policies. You should have a whistleblower protection clause so that employees know that there's a grievance procedure 
And if I grieve something and it un comes under the whistleblower protection, then um, you're safe from retaliation. And the other thing that you might want to think about is that you have a, I mean, you're too small, Stephanie, but um, you might want to have an ethical counselor or an ombudsman on staff, and that's someone who is completely without bias and can take, you know, is the person you go to when you have an ethical problem, um, you know, an ethical dilemma, an employee you can go to when they have an ethical dilemma. So they don't have to go directly to the person that they see is, is um, that they perceive to be acting unethically, but they can go to a neutral party. And that um, is something I think larger organizations do. It's a little bit trickier when you have a staff of two, um, because one of them would be the ombudsman, the other one wouldn't be, wouldn't work very well. Um, so uh, we kind of blew through this. I have one more slide, but we're earlier than it would have been with other people. But uh, let me just do the concluding slide, and then maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion. Um, just to have for you to take away with um, that as the leader of the organization, you're setting the moral tone for the organization. You know, people are going to look for you for the right thing to do. Um, and regardless of your style of leadership, whether you're, um, uh, whether you're, you're extroverted or introverted or, you know, all those different kinds of leaderships, whether you're agentic or what your style is, you can create an ethical culture. It's possible to create that in your organization. Um, and think about the means and the ends how you get there is as important as where you end up. And I think that's something that we frequently um, forget about, particularly in the nonprofit sector when it's so stressful, the getting money is so stressful and the need for it is so high. I think that frequently we think, all right, I'm just gonna do this so I can get this money. And that creates some ethical lapses perhaps in, in the means part of that equation. Um, so, and we talk about mission drift, you know, organizations that, that will do sort of different, you know, they'll go outside of their mission and maybe do a program a little bit differently because they can get money for that. And then that starts to, to drift them away from their mission and maybe drift them away from their ethical code. So that's something to keep in, to, to ask yourself, you know, how are we going to get to this end? How are, we, how are we going to reach these outcomes? And how can we be transparent about reaching those outcomes so that it's all above board and ethical? And then finally, treat others the way in which you like to be treated, which is you know, sort of where we started in kindergarten and, and is really a good golden rule to live by. And that's the end. So does anybody have any um, comments or questions or anything that you wanted me to cover that I didn't that you'd like me to talk about? There's a lot of talking on my half. I'm, I'm part. I'm sorry. It's, it's sort of turned into a lecture. Stephanie's writing. Well, I think you're right by becoming more aware and examining what you do, you know, sort of trying to look at yourself through um, another lens, you know, is my behavior translating into something that, um, that my employees are going to find ethical or my employees are going to want to emulate? Um, and I think it is becoming more aware, looking at what's out there, um, examining every decision through sort of an ethical filter. Um, so, good. Anything else? And I will send um, that link to that Stanford Social Review to you, Ellen. Does that make sense? And um, I like ethical filter. I, do. I like filters a lot. I think that's good. I do, too. I think I, I try to, um, sorry, I'm going off topic, but I, I look at, when I'm making decisions in my organization, I like to think about pushing it through the mission filter. You know, is this, does this really fit with our mission? or pushing it through our value filter. Is this really the way we want to be behaving with one another? Um, so I, I like the things that we think about the filter catching, um, you know, sort of like a colander. You know, it, 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 uh, keeps the, it strains, the, strains the decision so that it, you give a clear, clear answer. Okay, now I'm babbling. But um, I will, uh, as I said, Alan, I'll just send you that link. And is there anything else um, that anybody, that any other, Sources, resources, you know about common good, Stephanie, that's a good place to look for information as well. Um, it's just, I think it's commongoodvt.com, but, uh, .org, but you can just Google common good Vermont. Um, and that's a good place to get information about things. And I think that also on the uh, UVM Extension Building Capacity website is the, the video that I did of the three ethical Nonprofit directors, if you're interested in looking at that. Okay.
Well, have a great day, everybody, and thank you very much, Stephanie, for being our, our sole participant and having to be on the spot all the time. I appreciate that. Um, and I hope that uh, you got something out of it, and contact me if you have any further questions. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. The next webinar for the Building Capacity Series will be on Tuesday, April the 2nd, and um, I will be presenting uh, and leading the conversation about leading through change. So please mark your calendars and stay in touch with Building Capacity Resources in conversation on topics by visiting our website, friending us on Facebook, or sharing questions and comments through email.